وأصحابي أجمعين قال جل وعلا في كتاب المبين وإنك لعلى خلق عظيم قال إمام شرف الدين أبو عبد الله محمد بن سعيد البوصيري رحمه الله تعالى في قصيدته المضيح فما لعينيك إن قلت فاهمت وما لقلبك إن قلت استفق يهمي أيحسب صب أن الحب منكتم ما بين منتجم من هو مضطرم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Hopefully there wasn't too much confusion about the time. It was 6.45, not 7.45. Uh, did anybody see that? I don't think it was 7.45. Just Anita, you probably saw it. Yeah. Everybody else? Okay, that's... It's good that Muslims don't check, uh, like, updates. Because if they did... <laughs> They'll be here, they'll be late. So the negligence sometimes is a good thing. Um, the first time was right. Um, today, inshallah, um, we're going to cover two uh, lines, so uh, four hemistitches. Um, uh, and um, it's a little different to the first uh, two lines that we covered. Uh, much different, in fact, I'll introduce uh, the difference as well. Uh, and also, um, We'll talk about a few other issues, inshallah. Uh, there'll be no singing today. Uh, the Munshids have uh, disappeared. I think they've gone on strike here. Um, so they're in Morocco, I think. And the backup Munshids are also in Morocco. And uh, the premier Munshid is upstairs who doesn't want to sing today. So um, it's very difficult to convince him, I think. So... Uh, uh, but anyway, there's been uh, quite, you know, uh, more than enough singing. Uh, I wouldn't say more than enough. Uh, there's been, uh, we've had plenty of singing for the Rabi first 12 days. Um, and uh, it was day 14 now. And uh, so uh, we'll do something slightly more technical today. Uh, the singing can continue tomorrow. Shall I assume there's loads of uh, molids, uh, uh, even though it's contrary to... Uh, kind of a internet frenzy uh, about uh, molded problems but uh, today inshallah uh, the lines are a little different to what we've had before uh, in I wouldn't say completely different but they're still in the Nasib tradition but a little different and I'll introduce uh, if you if you recall where we were uh, we had just finished a line um, Uh, I think we did one line last time. Yeah, one line. Yeah. So the last uh, line that we um, we we covered last week was line two. I'm happy to reach into the Qa'i Kadimatin, where I'm the Barq of the Almighty in Islam. And I think I gave another overview of line one as well. But hey, and it's been four weeks, I think, since we last had a, a lesson. <laughs> The next lesson now, from now on, will be the first uh, Monday of every month, inshallah. Regardless, it will be the first, first Monday. Uh, the f can they sort this out? Um, it's too loud. The, the first two lines of the Burda were specifically to do with um, what we call Tajreed Nafsi. Essentially that means that Busiri talks to himself or he creates another. It's too loud. It's kind of a not Juan level loud. It's missing the echo. Um, and uh, he kind of recalls a memory about particular uh, place called Jerusalem and also a place called Idom um, 
and we talked about that at length. I'm not going to go over that again. Um, today, he changes um, as uh, Imam Tahir, uh, Tahir ibn Ashur states. Here, Busiri changes um, his, uh, not style, but almost uh, um, he makes, uh, how would I put it here? He takes a different direction. He takes a different direction. And poets uh, generally do that. They'll be talking about something very specific, and then they'll talk about something completely different. Um, it's not completely different, but it's different in terms of what, what he discussed in the first two lines. Today, we're going to talk specifically about the Arabic word hub and qalb, which love and the heart. Yeah, two things we'll talk about. These two lines cover, copiously cover those two topics. And all the commentaries are, and we'll be quite surprised actually that the commentaries are are not very expansive on these two lines. You don't have much on these two lines. In fact, Kharputi only dedicates uh, around about one and a half pages per line. So, which is for Kharputi, it's not much. Um, but it was so interesting, inshallah, we'll see. And I want to mix it with um, a few other topics that I've, I've thought of as well. So, the first line uh, that we're going to cover today is. Uh, the approach that I'm going to take with these two lines is slightly less technical which is I'm not going to explain the words that much because they're quite straightforward and the importance the importance of the line doesn't lie specifically in um, uh, the words and the ambiguity the words are very clear here whereas Dhu Salam was very ambiguous it could have meant many many different things and Ilam and these other words had very particular meanings um, or very spiritual meanings. In this line, as uh, if you have the translation, uh, it states, uh, What is the matter with your eyes that when you tell them to refrain, they only weep more? And your heart, when you try to rouse it, it only becomes more bewildered. Now, according to Sheikh Ibrahim Bajuri, great commentator on the Burda, has a marginalia on the border. Uh, and it's probably one of the most famous, uh, more famous uh, kind of commentaries on the border that people tend to use because he has both the, the simplified commentary on the grammar and the quite a simplified uh, commentary on the meaning of the words. And he adds a few spiritual benefits to it as well. Uh, he states that uh, here again, uh, Busidi is talking about love, but there's an element of denial here, whether we don't have that before. You see? Uh, entirely. Here, it's very clear. Uh, so he says, what is the matter with your eyes that when you tell them to refrain, they only weep more? Uh, he states that love essentially um, first is hidden. When people are in love, and we're going to look at that later, there are 10 different levels of it. There are 10 different levels of love. He states that when uh, people have love uh, or are in love, they hide their love. That's the first level. You hide it. Uh, and then uh, you almost deny it. Like, oh, no, not really. It's, you know, uh, until there are physical signs that disprove your uh, original denial. Uh, so, for instance, if Zaid, or let's take Majnoon, be Majnoon's kind of the case study. Uh, Majnoon and Layla, if you have Majnoon now, Majnoon originally would try to hide the love. Till to a degree he would try to deny it like no, no it's not really the case until some sign would indicate that his denial is 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 of no merit because uh, it's very clear and one of the signs that Busiri gives here is the aching heart and the uh, and uh, eyes flooded with tears so he states it's undeniable now if you're not in love then what's the matter with you um now uh, he states, "Fama li in 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 uh, our, our tradition, uh, especially amongst the Sahaba." And I want to try to connect these lines specifically to the companions today. Um, to be honest, uh, there's been um, one of the reasons I don't like to talk about in the Burda lesson because it kind of spoils the Burda lesson. But there's an element now in uh, in, in this day and age where the Prophet has uh, almost, for uh, some people anyway, um, have has become a a role model, however, that role model is uh, kind of uh, the. It's not what Allah said in the Quran. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي الرَّسُولِ لَا أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ. The Messenger of God is the best example for you. 
people are just taking the example and uh, disconnecting the example from the person. And what they tend to do is they'll say that it's the sunnah of the best of God and it'll be empty, it'll be completely, utterly empty. Uh, and even their type of love, love is very specific when I talk about it today. Their understanding of love is very uh, robotic. It's like uh, if you do something, that means you love that particular person. It's not actually the case at all. Even in a father-son relationship, um, uh, if the father tells the son to do something, um, just because he does that particular thing, it doesn't mean it's full of love. It doesn't mean it's full of love. It could be just because I'll just do it. So just because you do an action doesn't prove anything whatsoever. Just because you follow the sunnah, it doesn't mean you love the message of God. You see, uh, love has another dimension. Following is part of it, definitely. But following alone is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. It's like knowledge, you see. You can have knowledge, but it doesn't mean that you have knowledge that's beneficial. Uh, there are a lot of professors in this country, experts in Islamic theology, but the theology served them no benefit whatsoever. And uh, there's the, the, something very, very important. Uh, and this week I've heard from quite, and it's also on the internet and stuff like this, uh, of people misunderstanding um, uh, the messenger of God, alayhi salatu wasalam, misunderstanding the relationship of the Sahaba with him. I'll give you one example when you talk about love. Uh, before I, I was going to give this example in the next line, but I'll give it immediately, straight away. You know, the Sahaba, um, they, people constantly call saying the Umar, you know, and um, uh, they call say, misquote Sayyidina Umar, certain hadith about Sayyidina Umar Radulaan, that about he was uh, very um, strict and he's, uh, he was constantly um, telling people, reminding people, exhorting people to the sunnah, they have to follow the sunnah. And some people make it out like it was, it, it was kind of, he was just pushing people just to do the action. <laughs> But if you look at Sayyidina Umar's love for the Messiah of God, it's incredible. I mean, he killed people because of the Messiah of God, but they just disrespected him. You know, and he killed a Muslim because of that, because he refused to accept the opinion of the Messenger of God. He chopped his head off, and uh, Allah exonerated him in the Quran for it. Uh, he had an extreme amount of love for the Prophet, so we'll talk about it later. But let's look at uh, Abu Musa al Ash'ari very specifically. Yeah. After the demise of the Messiah of Allah, I don't really like the word, but there are not many words in English for it. After the Prophet ﷺ left this world, um, the Sahaba have struggled a lot. And we're going to talk about that in the next line. But one specific example I want to mention now, if you want to look at real love, uh, uh, love is something that's uncontrollable. Uh, the governor of Medina saw a man lying literally um, with his face uh, against the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. He was like lying on the grave and um, he went to rebuke him. He went to rebuke him like, uh, you know, what's this guy doing? When he turned to look, it was, it was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is uh, Abu Yubal Ansari, Afwan. He's a massive Sahabi. When he saw him, in one story, he, 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 he asks him what he's doing and he says, well, who do you think you are? <laughs> like, I'm a, the companion of the messenger of God. He was so overcome by his love for the Messiah of Allah. People would literally sleep next to his grave. This was for a very, very long time. So that's kind of forgotten when these, these people kind of mention, oh, we love also love the Messiah of God. I mean, love is a very uh, cheap word these days, you see. Uh, and it's almost like we love everybody else in a very particular way. Like we say, unconditional. You know, people love women and they show their love for women. And some of these are the same people that promote this type of thinking and this kind of undeniable, unconditional love. But when it comes to Masha, Allah, all of a sudden, everybody brings these restrictions. You know, the, uh, the love that the Sahaba had for him was absolutely uncontrollable. For a man to spend his nights sleeping on the grave of the Messenger of God is an uncontrollable amount of love for the Prophet Wasallam. Or when they saw uh, some of the companions literally going to the grave of the Prophet Wasallam and taking the dust and putting it over their bodies. Um, it's an uncontrollable amount of love for the Prophet Wasallam, you know um, so I don't buy this uh, kind of restricted for the Messiah of God but then when it comes to they've got more appellations for their uh, relatives or their, their, their wives or than the Messiah of God oh, be, 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 be careful you know you don't want to kind of exceed a, uh, I mean to sleep next to somebody's grave for nights on end or, or to leave your hometown uh, to leave a place where you've 
where you've moved to and return just because the message of God tells you to in your dream. We're going to get to that later, inshallah. So uh, he's crying, and uh, crying was amongst the Sahaba a great sign of love, crying. Uh, and it wasn't crying that was kind of triggered by uh, uh, people around them. Saying that Abu Bakr, if you look at uh, just before the Prophet left this world, the Messenger of God was too ill to leave the house for Salah, and he was with his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. And um, he said, Tell Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. And her answer was, She said, My father will not be able to lead it. And the reason she said that was because she said, He has a very soft heart and he won't, he'll be overcome by um, emotion leading the prayer with the word of God because he would profusely cry. And uh, the Prophet Sassim commanded her to tell them to tell Abu Bakr still to lead the prayer. Uh, and he would constantly send the Umar as well. They break down in their prayers because of their great connection. It wasn't a pseudo. A quasi type of love, it was very manifest in real true love. Saying that Abu Bakr, they would find him in the night time in his house, they could hear him uh, calling for the message, beseeching the message of God in, in the night time, weeping for the message of Allah. Alayhi salatu so, uh, tears were kind of true now. Um, it's it's kind of tears are quite circumstantial now in a gathering, or and sometimes it's better not to, even if people have the emotion, lest we mix our intentions up. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned a person who's truly uh, received the shade of Allah on the Day of Judgment. He mentioned seven. There are more than seven actually. Up to 40 people who received the shade. But the last person in the hadith is Rajulun, Rajulun, Dhakar Allah for Khalidin for Fadzat Aina. A man who remembered God when he was alone and he wept. And that hadith almost is for us like because uh, we don't know if our tears are true or they're, or they're not or sometimes get caught up in that. We believe them to be true, but, um, uh, you know, uh, loving the tears for the messenger of Allah, not for uh, we follow his sunnah, and, but for him, alayhi salatu I mean, um, you know, they did an experiment uh, with uh, your tears of, um, actually, Abdul Jabbar said a little bit about this, about tears of joy and tears of, um, of, of pain under a microscope and how they were different. Uh, the structure was different. It was incredible. I, I read it, and it was amazing for different different scenarios. I don't know how they tested it actually. You know, um, now uh, so it was a sign. But now it's very difficult to tell is it is if it is. But however, I one of my I was in Damascus. This was two thousand and two, um, and one of my friends he asked one of the sheikhs. He said, he said I, I can't weep. I can't cry. It doesn't work for me. You know, and he said, what should I do? You know, is there a way of um, um, of changing that? And the Sheikh said uh, to him that visit graveyards and and God will soften your heart. Visit you know, death, the destroyer of all pleasures, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said. And he said that will soften your heart to cry. And it's amazing how um, they say that even stones reacted to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi stones, and stones are inanimate. Then they don't have life. And they say now that even one of the ulama he said. Even stones, they react to the messenger of God. But hearts in this time have no reaction to the Prophet ﷺ. You know, and all they did was they just touched his hand. And this Ibn Malik, a very special hadith. He was a boy. And I mentioned this probably before. I'm, I'll repeat things as I go along. He said that the Prophet ﷺ, he just picked them up and they began to shake in his hand. And, and, and call, you know, uh, make dhikr of Allah. He kind of gave them life. Bithnillah. And uh, he put them in the hands of Abu Bakr and Umar, they carried on. He said, later we picked them up, like put them in our hands. And he said, they don't work anymore. He was only a boy and he wasn't at that level the, of Abu Bakr and Umar, where he could get the stones to react like that. But they just touched the hand of the Prophet which is incredible because he, they just touch his hand and they receive life, you see. And, uh, and they would give him salam as well, stones in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the sacred precinct would give salam to the message of God Ali Salatu, you know, recognizing him. Um, and we're going to talk about recognition in, the, in this next line coming up. And then he says, قَلْبِكَ إِن He says, and your heart, when you try to rouse it, it only becomes more bewildered. Now the heart is a very special thing. And I'm going to talk about some different opinions about the heart. Um, now Ibn Ashur, uh, or rather Ibn Ajiba, uh, say something, uh, mention something very, very nice about the heart. He states that 
um, first and foremost, whenever the poets mention the heart, it's not the physical element, uh, the biological heart. It's the it's the figurative, and he states the word in heart for Arabic is qalb, qalb, and in Arabic qalb means to turn, to turn, and he states that it it comes from what taqallub or, or connected to transformation or change. That's why it's called heart because qalb means to turn or to transform, and he quotes a line of poetry: "Wa masumi al insanu illa li unsihi wa mal qalbu illa anhu yataqallabu." He states, "Man is not named mankind." Because the word for mankind in Arabic is insan, insan. The root words are either uns or nasiya. It's a very important word, insan. It either comes from nasiya, which means to forget, because we're always forgetting. And last lesson, if you remember, we quote the hadith, al uh, arwahu junud mujannada. Souls are conscripted soldiers. And we talked about how we were together then for many hundreds of years, possibly. Thousands, maybe. Who knows? Millennia, who knows? And then we come back here and we forgot those relationships, except we can feel them. We can't remember names, but we can feel the relationship that was the almost uh, the ancient relationship we had. And we talked about this is really important because I'll just remind you if you've forgotten what I said last time. When you meet somebody, the Prophet saw some this hadith, Al Arwah Junul Mujannada. We were like soldiers conscripted in groups then. That whoever we liked, we that's who with the crowd that we were in. And when you come to the earth, Sometimes you meet somebody, you can feel a kind of like a connection with that person, a good connection. That's from there. It's not from here, according to Ibn Hajar. It's it's an ancient connection. And say that Aisha told a story about. She said a woman came. She was, a, if you remember, I mentioned last time. She said she was a very like a witty woman. She was a, had a good sense of humor. She came to Medina and ended up staying with a woman, the, another woman who was very witty and had a sense of humor. And she quoted the Hadith Al Arwahu Junud Mujannada. I.e., this this meeting was before, you see, um, and he so insan forgetfulness or uns, which means companionship. That we human beings are human beings because we 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 come together. And what's important about that is saying that Adam, say that Adam in the Jannah when he was created and put in Jannah. Imagine what's in Jannah. It's not like here. You have every single thing that you want from material goods, but he was still uh, 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 unhappy in Jannah. Unhappy with material, because material does not make human beings happy. If people think that they can buy here, uh, and buy and buy, um, and then that will make them happy because they've bought something. You know, you have the sales now, winter sales. Everybody turned up, not even knowing what they, why they're at the sales. Just go there anyway. But um, if that's going to make you happy, well, the highest level of what we call uh, material dunya. Uh, could not make Sayyidina Adam happy. He was in Al Jannah. He was in Al Jannah, and it did not make him happy. And then Allah created for him Sayyidina Hawa. Uns, you see, companionship, which gave him uh, happiness. So it's uns. So the Shaykh says, or the poet says, Insan is not named Insan except due to companionship. Uns coming together. He said, the heart is not known as the heart except that it transforms. Taqallubu. It's because it changes all of the time. Imam Bajuri states the qalb is called qalb for another reason. He says because within the heart itself, hidden inside of it is a secret that nobody understands. And it almost protects it. He says it, it's contained within the heart. Now, uh, Ibn Ashur says something really nice about the heart. He says the most common cause of love is seen. When you look at somebody, that's when you fall in love. What he says is really important actually. He says, when you look at somebody, he says, love is through the eyes, essentially. It's not always true. Some of them believe that men fall in love through their eyes and women through their ears. Um, meaning they hear about something, they can, but men, they have to see something. Even more material is superficial. Um, so uh, it's through the eyes. And Ibn Ashur states that, so he states, you look at something, you look at something or whatever you gaze upon, leads one to reflect so you have to see to reflect and then when you reflect uh, you remember every facet of that thing or person so if a person falls in love if a man falls in love with a woman he he sees the woman and then thereafter he will remember every facet or a facet of that woman her hair her face whatever that may be her hijab i don't know um, and then he'll remember that and what that does is that will uh, kind of cause his heart to go in a state of um, uh, the word he uses uh, is 
I put ferocious is the word he uses, or he sets his heart ablaze, even Ashur states. The word he uses for uh, facet or uh, recalling that person is Shema'il ibn Ashur, which states that when you are in love, what when you think about it, you you look at the Shema'il of the of the Mundur Ali, uh, um, the person you looked at. It's exactly the same for the Messenger of God, alayhi salatu wasalam. If you don't know what it looks like, then what are you really in love with? What you've heard, but you need to know what he looks like. You need to know all of those aspects that he had an aquiline nose, he had a wide forehead, he had reddish skin, al Azhar, as Anas ibn Malik states. He, um, his eyebrows, they, were, they did not join, they seemed to join, but they did not. You know, how will you know if you haven't any knowledge of what the message of God looks like? How can the heart then really, what will it reflect over? You know, it's got nothing to reflect over. You can't fall in love just with sunnah. You need to see the person. It's very important that love is just not contained within. We're following that. Following is love. It's not. You need to know the person. The whole concept of love is the person. The person. Um, now, the next line is connected to this line. That's why I don't want to spend too long on this because we're going to return to Qalb. Uh, uh, today, I, the main topic is hub, and uh, it's really, really interesting topic, and I'm going to connect it to some stories of the Sahaba as well. The word hasiba yahsibu or hasaba yahsabu or hasiba yahsabu comes on three scales. It means dhamma yadhunu to think. Okay. The word sub, this this is very. Uh, do you all have burda copies, but you should have it so you can see the words. Inshallah, try to bring your burda copies to lesson. It's unless you've memorized it. Inshallah. The word sub in Arabic sub means to pour something, sub, and it means to pour it until it completely it's flooded, basically. <laughs> yeah, sabul ma, you pour it and it fills the container. In love, a sob, what they refer to sob is a person that's overflowing with love. You see? So he's connected to a sob to here. Maybe the word sobbing is from that, I don't know. Who knows? Then? Possibly. Check it out, maybe. Um, he connects it to crying earlier. So he states, does the one in love, a sob, the one that's pouring with love, basically, and the signs are over, they're not hidden anymore. Think anal hubba munkatimun or suppose his love can be concealed. You see, now this connects to the first line or the previous line, which is he the overt signs are there. And we said the first state of love is that you hide it until it's a state of denial where you deny it, but then when you see the signs, there's no denial anymore. Yeah? Later he's gonna say, Wakifa tunkiru hubban ba'da ma shahidat. How can you deny it when you've seen it? Yeah? Yeah. You can see clear signs of uh, blood and illness. Saqam. Now, sure. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about the word hub and uh, katam as well, both of them. Now, katam is important because munkatim, this word comes, returns in chapter 2. Katam to sirran badali minhu bil katami. It talks about dye. Now, it's katam is a type of dye actually. It's a type of dye that you use to dye your hair. Uh, now, it's important because there's a hadith about the Day of Judgment. Uh, you may not know this, but it's really, really important. If you've got white hair, it's a very, very good thing. You know these Molvis, they dye their hair black. It's very, very problematic. I'll tell you why. Because there's a hadith about dyeing your hair black, and it's not very good. I know it's the difference of opinion. Hanafis are pretty strict on it. They only allow you to dye your hair in jihad and for your wife. And they're both uh, interchangeable. It's anonymous. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm a big trouble. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Asim is laughing as well. So he's in big trouble as well. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, what, what does it say about love and water? Yeah, so anyway, so there's a hadith that the Prophet said that 
in one hadith, uh, it, it has some weakness to it, but the Udu ulama generally accept it, that on the day of judgment, white hair will be munawwir, meaning it will give light. Uh, on the sirat, on the day of judgment, white hair will give light, uh, unless you spoil it. And Imam Munawi said that spoiling means uh, to dye it black, to dye it black. And somebody asked one of the Sahaba that uh, uh, can we dye our hair black? And he said, if you uh, if you if you do not want light on the day of judgment, and um, so uh, uh, white's really good. It's a sign of uh, uh, death, which is uh, really good uh, that you know because Sayyidina Umar he used to have this man come to his house every day, and imagine I mean, Sayyidina Umar is Amir al-Mu'minin, and Sayyidina Umar as well, which is two things. He is Umar and Amir al-Mu'minin. Uh, and which is his person very strong, seven foot six maybe in some narration, seven foot tall, very very you know powerful. Shaitan wrestled Shaitan on a path and pinned him down. Uh, so this man comes to Sayyidina Umar's house at Fajr time, and when he walks out, he says, "Ittaqillah ya Amir al Mu'minin, fear God, lead of the, telling Umar to fear God." And Umar pats him on his back and carries on walking. Like, Thank you very much. Like as really thanking him. And then one day Sayyidina Umar comes out of his house and tells the man in really like a, almost uh, in an angry uh, voice, he says, go away. And the man's like, after all these years, Amir al-Mu'mineen today tells me to go away. Was, you know, it took, me, took, it took him that long to get angry with me. But he wasn't angry actually. He said, why? Why today of all days? said, I've just seen some white hair. I don't know if it was on his beard or his head. He said, this is enough to remind me to fear God or of death. I don't need you anymore, basically. So uh, white hair is very, very good reminder in that regard. The first prophet ever to receive white hair was Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he says, he asked God, Ya Allah, what's this? He said, this is waqar and uh, like pure gold. And he said, Allahumma zidni waqar, Allah give me more of them. So he was the first Nabi to receive white hair. And the Prophet only had a few in the front of his hair. That when he would oil, he said you couldn't see it. He would, and the Sahaba counted them as well. So uh, that's what the word katam means. So I have sabu sabu. So sabu, you said earlier, it means to pour under the hub. Now I want to talk about hub. Now uh, from all of the kutub, to be honest with you, the commentaries, um, they talk a little bit about hub, and it's very very surprising in terms of the commentary on the burda. The, the the shortest commentary on the burda, I think anyway, is Tahir ibn Ashur's commentary. It's really short. He just like mentions a few things and a conclusion. Tahid ibn Ashur's longest section is this section on hub. He has like two pages on it. And it's quite a standard by and I'm going to read it out today. Um, Kharputi and the others, they have really uh, uh, esoteric discussions about hub. And at this point, I want to talk about some of the stories of the Sahaba about hub and other things. And I think you've witnessed that in the winter Mawlid as well. A lot of stories already. Now, I want to introduce the different um, uh, types of love that Tahir ibn Ashur mentions and then the different levels of love as well. By the way, I'm not laying claim to any of these. I'm just narrating what um, uh, the, the, mas the masters of the Burda have said. Okay, so there's no claim like, oh, I know about this. It's just kind of, I'm just, uh, you know, naqilul uh, aqwala, just a person who transmits. I'm just a messenger. So uh, Tahir ibn Ashur begins by giving the levels of love. So I'm going to, he states, ثم الحب له أقسام أعلىها قدرا حب الله ورسوله. He says love has uh, different types. The greatest ever type of love, actual real love, he said is love for Allah and His Messenger. Love for Allah and His Messenger. And he says the sign of this love, the overt sign anyway, is وعلامته فعل المأمورات واجتناب المنهيات is to obey God's commands to obey God's commands and to avoid uh, the prohibitions yeah to stay away from haram and to follow the way of the messenger of God as was uh, clarified or uh, in the books of hadith he said and this is very important you're gonna think you've just contradicted everything you said at the beginning the sunnah and the personal he said, "Hada hubul amah." He said, "This is just the the love that the public have. It's like a basic love. 
And this is very, very important, the differentiation here. When we said, I mentioned earlier, I don't want to spoil the kind of lesson of the Burda by talking about like controversial things, but when people say loving the messenger is following his sunnah, that's a very, very basic level. Very basic. He said, Hada Hubbul Amma. He said, anybody can do that. He said, that's just that's just normal standard, that's standard for them. Standard for them. You see, for general people to do. He said, Hubbul Khasa is much different. And he begins to go, I'm not going to go through the Maratim today. Different levels of what they call Hubbul Khawas. Yeah. And I'll give you an example about Zuhud. Again, not laying no claim to it. Uh, Imam um, Sheikh Salih al Farfur in his commentary to the famous hadith of Zuhd. Zuhd is uh, abstinence. And abstinence can mean different things. He talks about w- this great hadith that when the man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me, uh, give me something that the people who love me and God will also love me at the same time. Because everybody, you know, people kind of lie. They say, I don't care what people think, but we do it. We do care what people think. And why wouldn't, why shouldn't we? And why wouldn't we want people to love us as well? This man was honest with Sahabi. He said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me, or give me some advice. I want the people to love me and God to love me both to love me. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, and I'm going to I'm gonna give the meaning of the hadith, not the words. He said, don't compete with people in the dunya and, and, people, and people who love you because there's no competition. Nobody hates a poor man. <laughs> you see, if you drive a, you know, an old car, people don't hate on you. It's just a point. And don't compete with people. Not that you, don't, you shouldn't drive a good car. But generally, people only really have hazard when, when you have something that they want. And he said, uh, so he said that's what to and 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 uh, essentially the next the meaning of leave that which disconnects you from God and God will love you. It's the meaning of the hadith. You see, the meaning of the hadith. Now, uh, Sheikh Salih al Farfur commentating on this word abstinence because the hadith zuhd is had is the Prophet says ma bain al nas yuhibuk al nas. He states zuhd as different types. He said to basically. Not do haram is the abstinence of normal people. Just not to get involved with haram. See, you don't do haram, there's zuhud. That's a type of zahid, person who abstains. He said, so that's one. He said, then to leave that which is not the best thing to do, khilaf al-awla. This is like the zuhud of uh, pious people. Pious people, they, you know, they can do it, but they think, you know, this is not the best thing to do. He said, to um, to leave then that, uh, that to not enjoy in mubahat. So something is mubah, you can't do it, but you don't do it because you rather do something that's mustahab beneficial and get reward for it, even though it's mubah. He said, this is the zuhud of the khawas of the special people. And then he said, and the last level is to only busy yourself in that which connects you to God. Yeah? And anything that that busies you or takes your tawajjuh, your sight away from God, yeah, is, is an obstacle for you. He said, هذا زهد العارفين. This is the abstinence of the highest level of the people of God. What's the saying? حسنات الأبرار سيئات المقربين That the good deeds of even the pious people are like sins to the uh, the Gnostics. You see, so uh, that's the, the highest level. So the very basic essential of what Ibn Ashur is saying is following the Sunnah where people, you know, try to keep a beard and we try to, you know, uh, follow the Sunnah, uh, try to, you know, drink sitting, you know, the general Sunnah. He says, that's very basic. He said, the real love for Allah and His Messenger is the kind we mentioned earlier of Abu Yub al-Ansari, uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, for instance, uh, in his story, I'll talk a bit later about, about it. Then he states, the second type of love is Hubbu al-Abd. La li gharrat wa antifa' ba lillah. Yeah. Wa alamatu an la yazida bil bar wa la yanqusu bil jafa. Now, he states, the second type of love is... Uh, uh, the love of a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not for any specific purpose uh, goal or uh, intify any benefit but for Allah's sake for Allah's sake yeah he does something for Allah's sake yeah the third type of love that he mentions is what's called ishq we're going to talk about the definition of ishq a bit later um, 
yeah uh, is ishq. and this is a more um, generally and uh, he states a, a morous type of love and it can be love for people as well he states that you have general type of love for people he says the last type of love is madhmum is a detested type of love sharan uh, wa aqlan uh, and he says wa huwa al-hubb ma itiba' al-hawa it's full of caprice the type of love what we call lust these days basically a love for dunya you know you could say that so these are the types of love that he mentions but what's very very interesting <coughs> is when he talks about the levels of love which i want to talk about and it's kind of my main topic today before i get to the story of the sahaba in relation to the prophet sallallahu now tahir ibn ashur gives 10 maratib of hub 10 levels in his commentary to this line 10 levels of love uh, uh, levels of love maratib and he states wa'lam anna maratib al hubb kathira he said there are many but he kind of and he uses very special words in arabic he says the first level of love level of love is called hawa hawa is not a very nice word okay so i just kind of uh, hawa is caprice it's uh, uh, i don't know dr asim is here but i i just would think to think it to be superficial love you know uh, it's just superficial um, and involves so many other elements that are that dictate it that from the dunya for instance and you can reclaim it you know we were laughing last time about um, the word love in different languages and how cheap it is in Urdu uh, in, in English compared to Urdu like in English you can say you love anything you know I love my car I love my phone I love you can't say that in Urdu you let me be laughing at you make Coca-Cola and Muhabbat Karta you can't say that in Urdu and in Arabic you can't really say neither hope is very very special it's a word reserved for very special types of love um, but in English is very very cheaper you know uh, for we have it for foods now you see oh I love it you know it's like uh, so he says this and he doesn't even and the amazing thing is Ibn Ashur doesn't even explain it he's just as a you know caprice that's all he says and then he says the second is called alaqa alaqa and he says alaqa is al hubbul lazim and what he says about it is essentially that it, 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 it's it's a love that's almost intrinsic within you it's intrinsic within you al alaqa that connects you to something else and we have it for many many different things you know love for your friends love for your family members love for your children your loved ones it's a it's a natural type of love that you have natural type of love that you have it's not a destructive love uh, it's very very natural and everybody has it there's not a person that doesn't have it or that wants it everybody's all connected through that he says the third type of love is at the word kulfa in arabic means uh, like a, a burden like a burden allah says in the quran uh, uh, Allah does not give the Allah does not give the taklif, burden somebody with them more than they can bear. A takalluf. And he says that this is an extreme type of love. Takalluf. It burdens you, it makes you feel. And you're going to say, oh, that's what Busiri is talking about. This is only level four. Yeah. Uh, if you can imagine this to be like a, uh, like a computer game, and the master gets much more difficult, if you remember Shinobi. Anyway old mass system references it's going to get much heavier so takalluf it's not much but it still gives you makes it difficult for you to, it's difficult to bear and you can feel it as a burden it's really important in the quran you know in surah al-nashrah there's a verse in surah uh, uh, it's a really nice verse because uh, if you translate it literally it, it can be very problematic yeah, and Qada He is the one. Uh, the, he took a lot of a burden, lifting a burden from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, such a burden. And Qada, the word knocked in Arabic means to break something. Okay? It's used in debate as well to break somebody's evidence. Knocked. The burden that was literally, if you translated it, it would sound really odd. Such a burden that was breaking your back. Literally, but I don't like that. That was very heavy on your back. Now, if you read the general tafasir about this verse is really nice the general tafasi don't say much they they talk about different types of burden the sins of your ummah that were burdening you about ibn ajiba in what's his tafsir al-bahr al-madid yeah say something really amazing he states that this burden that the prophet had wasn't that 
the what we call tafsir ishari he said that allah gave a status to the messenger of god a status he made him in a particular way he said the prophet was worried that he would not be able to fulfill the title that god had given him and is worrying him all the time and god took that away from the prophet when he expanded his breast and that's what he was scared of that he would stand in front of God and not be able to fulfill the very intrinsic nature that God had given him the disposition Ibn Ajiba says uh, about the message of God Ali Salatu Wasalam so takalluf and maybe takal that meaning has a connection to what we mentioned the verse uh, the third is called law'a law'a or la'ij yeah? the word now law'a generally uh, from la'a yalu'u in Arabic la'a yalu'u if you open the dictionary, you'll find it means to uh, be overcome by amorous love, but it doesn't actually mean that. Uh, the word la yalu'u means to torture somebody. It means to torture. La <laughs> yalu'u. It has one meaning connected to torture. So you can tell what type of love it is. Um, and he states that it's. Uh, is it for me? It's a gift. Yes. MashaAllah. They come with gifts. Shukran. If I had it, I would have read some of it for, for you today. Before. Hey, next time. Uh, so, Lo'a, La Yalu'u. And he states that it's burning love. And he mentions a very specific point. He said, it hurts, it tortures you, but you feel some pleasure in it as well. You feel some love, specifically some taste in it as well. But it's it's very painful. The, sick, uh, the fifth type of love is uh, uh, ishq. You can use this, ishq may come before, you all know what ishq is. I don't need to really comment on that. The sixth uh, is another type of love which he calls uh, shagaf. Yeah. Shagaf. Uh, uh, shagaf a yashrafu. And shagaf means to hit something, to hit. Meaning, it's as if you're being beaten by somebody. It's that the love feels like that essentially. The seventh type of love, the seventh type of love is Joan or Jawa. Yeah, from uh, Jawa, uh, from uh, Jiwa, Yajwa. Yep. Um, uh, and Joan or Jawa means to be passionately stirred by love or grief um, it means both either to be stirred by love or grief and you can see that here it means both of them will be present some of these are very very close later we find a line in the burda na'am sarateifu man ahwa fa'arrakani wal hubbu ya'taridu lathati bil alam a'tirad in Arabic means to mix here that Busiri says pleasure love mixes pleasure and pain Shaykh Abul Huda recently did an extension to the Burda where he added uh, uh, lines to the Burda. Uh, I might, from next lesson, start to comment on them as well, the additions uh, uh, on those. And the, 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 he adds a very, the Shaykh adds a very nice line to that. Uh, the eighth type uh, of love um, is, yeah, is, uh, 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 yeah, Tatayyum. Or team, or team. Now, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, there's a, there's a. This word is connected to Allah, and we'll talk about how it's connected. This type to tell you means to enslave you, to make you a slave, to make you a slave. Yeah. Now, the word team literally means slave in Arabic. You can say team Allah to mean Abdullah. It literally enslaves you. This type of love, it enslaves you. You can see that it's becoming very more difficult, the types of love now. The ninth type of love, the ninth type of love that he mentions is called Tabal, from Tabala Yatbilu, Tabal. Yeah? And Tabal means to make you ill, to make you sick. Okay? Tabal, the ninth type. So the ninth type makes you literally physically ill. Yeah? Physically ill. It can kill you basically. Tabal. And the last type, type number 10 of love, yeah, is Al-Ashir, yeah, it's called Tawalluh, 
yeah from walaha yalihu he says atawalluh wa huwa dhihabul aqli he said this is the love where you become insane you've got no you've got no uh, ability to control your senses anymore the last the ninth one tabala tabala lam ya lam sorry afwan tabala yeah and um, he states he says any idamul aql like you have no aql left yeah and hawas all your senses have gone and he says well he said you, you the, the the person who's like this he said he's in the asylum he's with the mad people you see by the way this is a musiri because this type of love isn't good when you become mad it's not good i might talk about this a little bit actually because we're all slightly mad at <coughs> everybody is in this day if you're mad like the poet said in this generation you're actually sane the supposed sane people are actually mad at. mad people are all sane um <laughs> so anyway we'll, 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 we'll i'll talk about this a little some of the people of god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they they became what we call the in morocco they call it majdub it's majdub Jazba in Arabic, I want to talk a little. So those are the maratib of love. I'm going to comment on them now. I'm going to comment on the, the last part of the line. And then I'll give my overall commentary now. Those are just kind of the explanation of the verses. Um, I want to talk about very specifically that last type of love. Majdub or jazba or in a state of jazb is a kind of a state where you overcome. Uh, have you heard the famous term wajd? Wajd. Do you know what wajd means? I don't know what it means. It means to find something. Wajd I usually do means to find something. Now, wajd is a state where you realize realization. Now, I will tell you, I'm very clear about 99% of the wajd in this day and age is completely utterly fake. You know, my teacher, he was really vehemently against this because a lot of people, they start to show this kind of wajd. You see them in like certain gatherings and they all of a sudden the wajd. And he said, that, he said to me that what to do is quickly just take a pin, start poking the person. He said they wake up very quickly. <laughs> So I added to that, I you know, kind of uh, advanced that theory, and it's very simple. Take their phone, <laughs> take their phone, watch how they snap out that wajd. Take their phone, and that's the kind of wajd we have. It's all fake, actually. You know what it is? It's what people receive in nightclubs now. You know when they go to nightclubs? Not that I've ever, I've never been to nightclubs, but <laughs> I'm just uh, it's common knowledge. Is that you know once you're in the the beat and it's making you you know, I assume don't. Uh, uh, I'm, yeah, I, I, I would assume that's what they do. Uh, yeah, I haven't taken anything neither. So, and it's the music and it's the rhythm that's making them. You see, it's not a spiritual state. A lot of these people are just overcome by the rhythm. For instance, often the poetry is in Persian. They don't have a clue what it means. You see, but the Qawali sounds pretty good, you see. And all of these guys are in Wajd. Wajd, they can't find themselves in Fajr. But they have found God in the gathering. It's all fake. It's just a kind of chemical imbalance, that's all it is. Chemical imbalance. I'm in wajd all the time, eh? when we're angry, eh? we find wajd there as well. We lose our senses. So it's so that's wajd. A majdub, a majdub person, majdub from jazz, but that's different. Is a person essentially who they say they define him as a person who generally you you go through stages. The ulama, they say, the awliya, the Gnostics, they say, people go through stages to train, be trained by the great Gnostics to reach God. And every stage has a, a time period, you know, some of them, it takes them 40, 50 years, you know, uh, some of them, all of their lives, you know, they're cleaning dishes for two years, you know, uh, all of these funny, you know, these kind of odd things now, because people now, they want, uh, they want to attain without a struggle, you see, attain without struggle, and it's, it's very, very odd, you see, it's uh, uh, unbefitted, it's un there's a great Turkish sheikh, he had all these kind of disciples, and uh, one of his disciples uh, was uh, uh, the baker. He cooked the bread. He, he baked the bread. Sorry. And uh, the sheikh, before he... So they were waiting. The sheikh's really old. He's trained them all. And uh, uh, before he passed away, uh, he said, I'm going to leave you my representative. They all like, you know, everybody's after it. <laughs> the, as Hassan al Basri said, the last thing to leave a person's heart is love for leadership. So they're there, like, 
please let it be me. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. I was like, not really, but really. Eh? He said, go and get the baker. He brought the baker and he sat him down and he, the sheikh said, this is your sheikh. Because he'd been training him all this time, you see. Training him and training him. Uh, and nobody would assume that that's a, a level of tasawwuf. But the mother, for instance, has a high level of tasawwuf than anybody because she she nurtures, you see. You know the word uh, murabbi in Arabic? The word for a Sufi sheikh is murabbi. It comes from the word tar uh, tarbiya. Tarbiya means to nurture. Allah is rabb, rabiba. It means to Allah is rabibun. Rabb is the one who nurtures from tarbiya. It comes from the word to plant and to nurture, uh, 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 to nurture and plant. Uh, uh, and and the sheikh is murabbi. The mother is murabbiya. Is the one who nurtures that it's the most difficult thing to do, you see. My teacher used to say all the time to me, see, my teacher very, had a very specific uh, skill. He takes people who have no knowledge, zero, he takes clean slates, that's how it works, and he trains them to high level. He said it's very easy for a teacher to take something that's made already. It's very difficult to take uh, somebody who is who has nothing, you see, and it's a, it's a very, very difficult to work with a, with somebody who's just you know um, completely a blank slate, uh, a blank slate. Uh, they uh, so uh, uh, this is kind of the, um, the the real meaning of 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 wajd. So what these people do? Sorry, going back to my point. Uh, instead of going through the training, these people all of a sudden they reach ma'rifa. With that kind of, they kind of skip some steps and they, they rationally can't, they can't take it. It's too much for them. And they, they kind of lose certain senses in the world or attachments. And that's why they look crazy. They look mad. So they do crazy things. So they'll smoke, for instance. And they say, give me a cigarette. I met one in Medina Munawara. I met this man. Ahmed Sufi, he called himself. What this man? He he was he he. You could smell really bad odor from him. Sweating. Teeth were all like he was unkempt. Walks up to me. He said, "Give me a cigarette." Dude, I don't smoke. He said, "Do you know me?" No, I don't. Know he said, "My name is Ahmed Sufi." Alright, Ahmed Sufi. Come, Ahmed Sufi. And then he said, "No, Ahmed Sufi." And he he had an imaginary flute. So I'm going, bup, 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 Ahmed Sufi. So I'm looking at this guy. I'm saying, and I was at the gathering of Shaykh al Zakhir Bukhari, passed away now, Rahimullah Ta'ala, passed away, died at 126 years of age. He was in his gathering and he said, uh, said You're going to pray in the masjid? He said, yeah. he said, uh, said do, you know, do you know me? He kept saying, Do you know Ahmed Sufi? He said, uh, Give salam to the Prophet Sassam for me. He said, The Prophet knows who I am. He knows who I am. He said, tell him he's Ahmed Sufi. Oh, like, listen to this guy. He said, do you know when I go to Masjid? He said, I pray behind the Messenger of God. I just kind of looked at him and stepped back. He said, yeah, I pray behind the Messenger of Allah. And then he walked off. Then I did some digging up. I asked somebody about him. This man was is from Syria. He left many years ago without passport. He was one of the murids, I think, of Sheikh Abdullah Sarajuddin. I'm not sure though, I can't remember. Or his father, or his grandfather. And he was Majdub. He's Majdub. He's uh, lost his senses. But he's a man of God. Uh, and you don't mess with those types of people. In, in actually, in, in training of spirituality, you're not allowed to take the company of these people. You're not allowed to, because they expose you, you see. They'll just all of a sudden just say, Oh, you're a shaitan. You know what he was doing last night? You're just like that. So you don't sit with them, then you're not allowed to sit with them. Because they'll just explode, they get really angry and they just start saying things about you. You don't want to mess about with them. So you have to be very careful. Or they say, if they get angry and make a dua, it will come true. You know? So they say, God kill him. And then, and there's famous, you've, there are famous stories about it amongst the Salaf, even of these types of people. They're not to be messed with. Now, now in Birmingham, we have hundreds of Mujzubs now. <laughs> You mean like two in your life? Huh? Like, yeah. So as for what we call this level of majanin, almost they lose, that's not majnoon, is somebody who loses every sense. Some of the people of God lost all of their senses even. They weren't even recognizable anymore. Recognizable, they were begging God to destroy them. 
as Ghazali says. They wish God turned them into dust. You know, you know, Rabia Basriya said, she said, God, uh, between me and you, there is me. She said, remove me and there's only you. Um, so they, some people, they're completely lost their senses because of this type of love. It's a very, very, all of these types are pretty dangerous. But the last one is the most dangerous. You know, you know, you see sometimes people, they kill themselves over a woman or a woman over a man, they kill themselves. You see, they go mad, they lose all senses. And it's very, very dangerous. That's why love has to be controlled. And that's why the awliya, they, people have to be trained in spirituality, mm. even in loving the Prophet ﷺ. I know a person, of a, a person, and he, had, he, 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 he started going crazy. He, in, for 15 days in a row, saw the Prophet ﷺ. 15 days in a row, and he was going crazy. And he went to his teacher, and he said, I can't, my, I can't take it anymore. You're going to say what kind of, you know, why why couldn't he take it, everybody? But whatever he was seeing, it was completely overwhelming. He didn't have the, he didn't have the strength to cope with it. You see, so you have this type of, uh, uh, it's not everybody should ask for it. It's very, very difficult, the burden. You know, Sheikh Saleh Jafri, Sheikh Saleh Jafri, Rahmud passed away, a great Imam of Azhar, was sitting one day, was sitting one day. And they said to him, I'm sorry, there are kind of tangents where I haven't got to the, some of the things I want to say yet. What's the time? Oh, we've got plenty of time. Um, we've got an hour. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't prepare material for till nine o'clock for, because there's no singing today, you see, it's a burden anymore. He was sitting one day and he said, these people, they say that my Sheikh's Qutub, my Sheikh's Qutub, he said, they can, he, this was, he said, there can only be one Qutub. He said, by God, which Sheikh would want to be a Qutub? He said some sheikhs, they reach the level of kutub, reach level, the level not, they don't become kutub. Kutub is a very high level of spirituality. He said, who would want to be the kutub? He said, the burden that that man has to carry. He said, nobody would want it. He said, look at Khadr. Khadr, who's a Nabi according to some, a Wali according to some. What did Khadr do in the Quran? What did he do? What was the, what did he do? What was the second thing that he did? Rather, the first thing that he did? He killed a child. He killed a boy, killed him. Can any of you kill a boy child? If God said to you, kill a child, would you kill that child? A seven-year-old boy, you know, in a completely innocent, this boy's. And God says to you, kill that boy, could you do it? You couldn't do it. This is what these people have to do. So Khadr killed him. Why did he kill him? He saved him, as we know, really, because he would have become evil, but he... He, he was taken before he could reach that age, so he was saved. But the meaning of that story, by the way, is that what did God say? That he would replace it with something better. Replaced it, the, they gave, the mother gave birth to a girl. The, that girl married uh, uh, and she gave birth to one of the prophets of Ben Israel. Anyway, this is, that's a long story. So, um, but could anybody do that? That burden, imagine that happened and he said who would want to be one of those types of people so these kinds of dreams of grandeur people have to be careful about what these people have to go through as well the kinds of things that they have to go through um so uh now i want to talk about connect this line to the sahaba and this next segment i want to take out uh, with the meaning of the lines so we've covered kind of some of the mufradat uh, and some of the words sub and munkatim and other words the last part he said, Ma bayna min minhu wa I'm probably two comments I want to make on that, and then we'll move on. Uh, no, actually, I'm just going to translate. It's fine. Um, so the translation reads, uh, between pouring tears and a blazing heart. There's some commentary to this, but I'm going to cover it later anyway when we speak about other topics. Tarim essentially means something that's blazing, but I don't really want to cover that today. But later we're gonna we're gonna cover some aspects of both of these words. Now, what I want to talk about now is a connection of our tradition with these lines, with weeping, which we covered already, with love, especially, and this overwhelming love that sob that pours out. And I want to talk about its reality and the Sahaba, the Messenger of God, and the month of Rabi'ah. These things connected. 
together. Now, um, this month is very special, Rabia. However, Imam Suyuti said that, Rahmullah Ta'ala, about the Mawlid, he, he said that we're not for these great grandiose types of Mawlids. Imam Suyuti said it, where money is wasted and food is wasted. He said that's not the meaning of the Mawlid. And unfortunately, we are, uh, some of our Mawlids are not very well uh, organized. And uh, I, I've said it before, and probably going on the internet again. You know, people are cutting cakes on Mawlid, and I detest it with all my heart. Cutting cakes, and this is the message of God we're talking about. You cut cakes for your children, not for the message of God. Asking people put candles on the cake. I mean, you know, these types of things. We don't need all of that. You want to love the message of God? The message of God doesn't need your cake. It needs your salawat. And he doesn't even need that because God raises his rank regardless of whatever we say. He has no need towards us in that regard. We have need towards him. What I want to talk about now is why So this month is special first. Then just a little point I want to make, a little dig maybe. And then, yeah, you, can't, you can't say it because it's important. And then I want to talk about the Sahaba. This month is very, very special. Why? Sayyid Muhammad ibn Aliwi al Maliki rahmullah ta'ala states the following. He said, Arabs had many months that were famous. Muharram was famous. The Arabs loved the month. Sacred for them. Dhul Hijjah was sacred. People came to make Hajj. Rajab was sacred. There were sacred months to the Arabs. Jahili Arabs. He said, sacred to the believers, there were months. Muharram. The 10th of Muharram was the month Ashura. That Musa alayhi was given his opening saying that Musa alayhi salam. Some say he split the Red Sea on this day. They say it was the day that Sayyidina Adam turned to his Lord. And we believe, based on the hadith of the uh, Mustadrak of Hakim and other variations of that hadith, that it was through the, uh, the intercession of the Messenger of God alayhi salatu wasalam. Forgive me for the sake of whose name was next to yours uh, in Al Jannah, in the hadith of Sayyidina Adam. Now, um, why why not that month? Why wasn't he born in Muharram? But everything is done for a reason for the message of God. He's born in Rabi. Why? Rabi, the Arabs don't have any consideration for his spring. Why was he born in a month that the Arabs or our tradition, the Abrahamic tradition, has zero importance in our tradition, Rabi? I'm telling you nothing, you will find nothing about Rabi. Nothing. Why? Why? Why would Allah choose that much? Why not Muharram? For one reason, one reason, I only said Muhammad uh, ibn, uh, said Muhammad ibn uh, Ali al-Maliki, he says for ex- exclusivity, he said because so his, his birth will not be shared with any other event. That when you say Rabi', you don't remember Ashura. When you say Rabi', you don't remember Hajj. When you say Rabi', you don't remember Al-Isra al-Mi'raj. When you say Rabi', you say Yom or Shahr, which the Prophet was born in. You can't think of any other event that took place in that month except the birth of the Messenger of God. Those people who say, and he died in that month, the Messenger did not die. He did not die. People don't die. This is an atheistic understanding of death. Shaitan tricked you. <laughs> the what's, what's death? What's death? Ghazali says, intiqal ruh min makan ila makan in akhar. The shifting of a soul to one place, from one place to another. Who said the Messenger of God is dead? Harram Allahu ala al-ardi. God has made it impermissible for the earth to consume bodies of prophets. The messenger of God is alive and God sustains him. They're alive not like us, they're alive in the, alive in the Ithmas life. Imam al Nawawi ta'ala states, Prophets make Hajj and Umrah every single year. Don't take it up with me and go at us to talk to Nawawi Abu Zakaria, the, the greatest scholar of his time. He said, Hajj and Umrah every year. You know, how many prophets did the Prophet also meet in the earth on the night of Mi'raj? You don't know what you're messing with. <laughs> I mean, so um, this is the lofty status that the messenger has in his grave. Sa'id ibn Musayyib. You know Sa'id ibn Musayyib? Put your hand up if you know Sa'id ibn Musayyib, the name, if you've heard of it. You know you heard of it. None of you. So I, I tell you. Sa'id ibn Musayyib is a tabi. He's a man who met Sahaba. He's so famous and so trustworthy. That if he narrates a hadith without mentioning the name of the Sahabi, they used to trust it. Because they investigated them and they found them all to be true anyway. Sa'id al-Musayyib, when Yazid, Yazid, everyone familiar with Yazid? Yeah? 
that's pretty much enough that I, <laughs> I don't want to say anymore about spoil my mouth uh, <laughs> they celebrate they celebrate the uh, he spoiled the lesson Yazid when he uh, attacked Medina al Munawwara he uh, took soldiers into the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu some riwayat the animals even took him to the masjid and uh, some of the tabi'een they hid they hid and Sa'id ibn Musayb hid in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu and they asked him later, they said, Ya Sa'id, Ya, ya, ya Imam, he was the Imam, the greatest scholars of the Salaf, without the eye. Um, so they said, how did you pray your Salah? How did you know you were hidden in this little area without sunlight? He said, I could hear the Adhan from the grave of the Messenger of God, Ali Salatu Wasallam. I mean, this is kind of, um, we're going to talk about other narrations like this in, 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 in a little while. Yeah about um, uh, the Messenger of God. So this month Rabia is very special for the, for the Messenger of God. It's a spring month. Why? That's where greenery comes out. Yeah, all greenery needs lighter. Perfect weather conditions. It all needs the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's important for that reason. Number two, my one point that I wanted to make. Um, we are people who come together to remember the Messenger of God in this, this month. That's our sole intention. And this is Sunnah of the Sahaba in the hadith narrated by Ibn Majah in his Sunan that in the masjid of the Prophet a group of people are sitting one day. It's a sound hadith. Okay? And something really important. You know, we need to get over kind of refuting. I'm not for it. I mean, we've got no time for that. I mean, people can do what they want. We're going to do what we want to do. And they've, we spent long enough and many years them kind of spoiling our gatherings. You go, you got your masjids, do what you need to do. We got our masjids, leave us alone. You know, Imam Busiri says, he says, like, leave me alone. He says, Ya la imi fil hawal udri ma'adhiratan mini ilayka wa la'un safta lam talumi. He says, oh, you criticize me. Like, leave me alone. It's, that's not the translation, but that's what he's saying. He said, by God, if you knew what I, what, you know, what our emotional state was with the masjid of God, he said, you will never blame me, blame me for it. He said, leave us alone. <laughs> it's like, we're not harming you. You know, if the lights are hurting your eyes, we'll take them off. You know, so <laughs> you'll need them on the day of judgment, trust me. Anyway, so, um, but what I want to say here is, there's no room for that anymore. There's no room for that. What we need is just to do it. We just need to remember the message of Allah. And in this hadith, the sound hadith they're sitting, the Masjid Allah walks into the, in the Masjid of the Masjid of Allah. He said, What are you here? What are you doing? Well, why did he ask them that? You don't go to the Masjid and gather together without the permission of the Masjid of God generally. Yeah. You say, Ya Rasulullah, we want to do something in the Masjid. What should we do? They were just there. He's looking at them. You know, in the Hadith, they don't, doesn't mention which Sahaba were there. The Prophet asked him, What are you doing? He said, Ya Rasulullah, we've come together today to remember God and thank God for sending you to us as a ni'mah, as a bounty. For that, that's why we're here. You see, look at the, what they're there for. He said, Allah, by God, do you swear that you came for that? They said, by God, we swear that we came for that. He said, I did not uh, question you because I doubted your intention. It's because God is praising you in the company of the angels. For what you have done here. That wasn't a gathering commissioned by the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu It was commissioned by the love for the Messenger of God. They gathered in the masjid for that specific reason that we gather in the Mawlids for. So if you got a problem with us, you're going to have a big problem with Sahaba. <laughs> you see, we don't do it on specific days. We do it all the time. A person who does it on specific days, something's wrong with him. Man. People just get together in the 12th Rabi. I wouldn't you kick him out of the, the majlis. You don't gather, gather together 12 specifically. You know, love is not, you know, sitting with my teacher and he didn't know what Valentine's Day was. He said, but I get your Valentine's Day. He said, that's what you know, Valentine's Day is, is 14th of February. It's where, uh, where two people, what a, well, not always two people. If a person loves another person, sometimes anonymously, they give them gifts or they get together, have this, you know, you know what it is. They explained it like that. 
said, yeah, to both ajeeb. Huh? He says, really odd. He said, ek hi din, puri, puri saal mein ek hi din. I said, ek hi din. He said, husband and wife for one day only. They show love. I said, yeah, maybe. I, mean, I said, he doesn't know the background to it. Like, you know, the kind of the historical background. I said, I said is it okay? Is it allowed? He said, they can get masakin jo hai, because these poor people. He said, at least I've got one day, yeah. <laughs> but I said, I said, no, no, you don't know where it came from. And he said, oh, he said, I don't know. I don't. It's so, it's, it, that's, we don't have that for, for the message of God. We don't ever get to listen on one day. It's, it's a constant state. And we're going to look at the Sahaba. And that's why the scholars, and some scholars, had a problem with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, one day we're going to get together and that's what we're going to do. You know, they had it with a lot of things. You see, a lot of things they had it with. You see, so uh, even though the day that the Prophet was born is greater than Laylatul Qadr, according to Ahmad ibn Taymiyyah, <laughs> lay, lay, greater Laylatul Qadr. What happened Laylatul Qadr, tell me? What happens? The difference of opinion. Angels come down, your deeds are recorded. What happened on the day of the Mawlid? If we wouldn't be sitting here otherwise, the messenger of God was born. Do you see the difference here? And he says, because of that, he said it's greater the day that the Messenger of Rasulullah was born. So uh, that's the day, just my part on the day. Now I'm going to go to the, the part of the line's connection with the companion. Um, um, I'm going to talk about some of the, 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 the companions for uh, the, you know. You know the companions of the Messenger of God, alayhi salatu, we will never ever be able to understand them. I promise you that. Ever, never, we, we just won't be able to comprehend their state, make a heart of their ahwal. Never ever will we be able to do it. You know we sit and we talk about the great kind of uh, leadership of Umar ibn Khattab. We, and we can do that in... but. That's not what he was about. Or the great leadership of Abu Bakr. They were about their connection to the Masjid of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. Their leadership is connection to us. But their connection to the Messenger of God was, was, was written or decided is primordial. Known by God. And I want to talk a bit about that because it's kind of lost. I have, we have no, you know... Um, it's very, uh, I tend not to um, talk about persons. I don't really do talks on, uh, we don't have lessons on personalities much. Uh, like, let's do, uh, let's have a long lecture on, uh, except Busiri, and I'll say, I'll tell you why, the Ghazali. You see, uh, for the public, for privately, for students, we do have. Why not? Because you know, if I talk about Ghazali, I'm going to depress myself and you. You're not going to be, we're not going to be Ghazali, are we, really? And you think about things, man. I can't like stop doing this and you're talking about Ghazali or Suyuti who saw the Prophet in a wakeful state some say 40 times, some say 50 times or Khustalani or you know Taftazani or then you're like you feel depressed leave alone Sahaba then you are finished completely you see it just kind of depresses us however to, I told Abu Sidi because Abu Sidi it was reformed he wasn't like that before I'm not saying he was like us but Busiri was a poet who was inspired by the messenger of God and then he became Busiri. He became, he became Busiri then before that he was Muhammad ibn Sa'id. <laughs> then he became the Imam. But I will talk about the Sahaba today because I want, to, I want to talk about some real special things about them just because it's just so apt. Um, first of all, I want to talk about love. The Prophet Sassim said sitting with the Sahaba one day and he said to them, that the ones who love me the most, the most, the most. By the way, when we say that, we kind of almost exclude the first three generations. Don't think we, we can never love the message of God like Abu Bakr Siddiq, ever. You can't, can't do it. We don't have the, the biology. We don't have the chemistry. We don't have anything. We don't have, we don't have the, uh, we don't have, we're not that product. We're not that creation. We can't, it can't happen. You know when people say, oh, we're going to be like Abu Bakr. You're not going to be like Abu Bakr. 
The Prophet said, if you took Abu Bakr and the whole of the Ummah, they would not amount to him. Not because he prays more than you or fasts more than you, because God has put a secret in his heart that none of you have like him, which is the love of his messenger, love, love of me. You can't do that. You can't love the Prophet like yeah, Fatima to Zahra. And I, I'm going to introduce it after I mention the Hadith of Sayyidina Fatima to Zahra. And I'll tell you why. He said, The ones that love me the most, Ashaddu Ummati Li Hubba. He said that people who have never seen me. Listen, inshallah. Yeah? Never seen me. They will come after me. He said, They will be willing, listen to this, to sell, to sell their families and give up everything they have just to see me. They're willing. They're willing to give, rather, they're willing to give everything up for me in one narration. Just willing to just give it up to see me. Now, uh, it's, I, I would, you know, people sometimes say, oh, and that's us. No, <laughs> it ain't us. It's probably when Imam Mahdi comes up. Those people, <laughs> because the Prophet has described them very specifically. But my point is what? My point is that honor has been reserved for what's to come after. So that honor is achievable in this time. You see, because he said it himself, Ali Salatu Wasallam. He said it himself. He, he said it himself. I want to start with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to start with Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra Ali. So just as some people that. I have no right to talk about Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra Ali. Sayyidah Fatima is, um, uh, is a piece of the Messenger of God, Ali Salatu Wasallam. And you have to be super careful. Why? Uh, our ulama have to, our people of God, the Gnostics have told us that um, when you say something, commenting on the words of the Prophet uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, La tarfa aswaqum fa aswaqum fa nabi. Don't raise your voice above the voice of the Messenger of God and do not talk to him like you talk to each other, lest your actions disappear and you didn't know. On that last habitat a'malukum wa antum la tash'urun. That your actions disappear and you know you know not. When they comment on that, they say sometimes you have to be sometimes you'll say something about the family of the message of God and it just comes out wrong. You have to be very careful. You have to know who you're talking about. Because the Prophet Sahih Muslim said, I leave you two weighty things. If you hold on to them, you will never be misguided. In another narration, they will they will be they will they will they will be separated to meet me at the, they would they would meet me at the Haud. He said the Quran and my family. That's a hadith Sahih Muslim and my family. You have to be very careful. So Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam is, is the most beloved daughter of the Messenger of Allah. The most beloved. Okay? Not that he did not love his other daughters. But she is the most beloved to him. She is... A, why? There's reasons for it. You see? There's reasons for it. Um, and uh, she... She... As a young child would go run out of the house she would almost be on watch run out of the house that whenever the Quraysh would try to trouble the Prophet she would go in his, out in his defense as a little girl seven, six, seven she wasn't scared of them that's something she loved Ashaddu Hubban Ya'ni for her father so much so that when uh, they upset her say the Fatima to Zahra salam, in that same narration where they threw the carcass on the Messenger of God on his blessed body, Ali Salatu was said that Fatima cleaned it off his clothes and she was weeping that he cursed the people who did never curse his, the Messenger of God did not curse people by name, but because they upset his daughter, he did every one of them died. Every one of them, just like Ubay bin Khalaf, who the Prophet Sallallahu said, I will slay you. And he gave him just a paper cut that killed him. And he said, For if my saliva were to have touched him that day, he would have died. You see. So you have to be very careful when we talk about Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Some of them say that no man he becomes a wali except he has a stamp of Sayyidah Fatima. So she's the most beloved daughter. They say there are narrations that she would go to the grave of the Messenger of God after he left this world and literally take the sand from his grave and put it over her body. No man ever saw her except those who were mahram to her, ever. And her status is so great that even on the day of judgment, nobody will see her. Nobody will see her on the day of judgment. <laughs> even on the day of judgment, that the angels will lower her gaze, their gaze when she crosses the bridge. 
That's the status that she carries. Her love for her father was for the messenger of God was such that she wanted to die. She wanted to leave this world. And she was granted it by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, and what's amazing is you see the kind of reciprocated love here. I just want to know one thing about it, then I'll move on. When she came to the Prophet and she was weeping. She knew what was going to happen. She had told her, you see. And Allah took every one of his daughters in his lifetime, alayhi salatu all of them passed away, you know, Zainab, all of them died. Except Fatima. Why not? It's amazing. Why not Fatima? It was almost a gift for the Prophet that he didn't have to see Fatima leave this world. You know, he didn't have to see that. Because that's how close she was uh, to the Messenger of God. So that's how close. You know, uh, uh, I was shocked. I was in London. Hope this is not the case in Birmingham. I said to them, where did say the Fatima liver? Everybody's looking at me. How can you not know this? The door of Fatima, the door, literally the door of Fatima. You've seen it. The door of Fatima, alayhi salam. Say the Fatima. I've seen the door. You, you know, you can't, I don't know if they've blocked it now. And the handle, what's written on it? The line of the Burda on the handle. Where's the messenger buried, alayhi salatu salam? Where did Fatima live? She was always connected to the Messenger of Allah in every single way. In proximity, spiritually, physically, physically. And he said to her, and he didn't watch, he didn't have to see that. But he, she was given a gift as well by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She couldn't take the world anymore without her father, without the qurb to her father. You see, that God just six months and God returned, said the Fatima, uh, to the company of her father. They're waiting. Uh, for his daughter to to reach him, that's how immense her love. Was. How you know people talk about love? Her love was so immense she didn't want to live anymore in this world. Now that's immense love. People talk about sunnah and always following the sunnah. But let's see it. If you love the messenger of Allah, are you willing to say today, God just take me? A Sahabi asked for his eyesight to be taken away after the messenger of Allah left this world, and God took it away. You want to know about love? This is an extreme type of they talk about extreme it's very extreme if your father passes away or your mother and you love them or your children and you say to God oh Allah remove my eyesight people say you're crazy you want to be blind say I, I don't want to see anything anymore but why not that for the message of God <laughs> now there we have to have restrictions Sahaba didn't have any control of it I say the Fatima did not because it was connected to the message of Allah and he would get up and she would come in and he would put her in the place that he was sitting previously and his love was immense for Sayyidina Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. You know, she's al-Batula. She never had menses in her life. <laughs> she's the pure one, Sayyidina Fatima to Zahra. And uh, everybody should name their daughter Fatima. Everybody, just everybody. It's, an, it's, it's you know, names in this time will save your children. <laughs> you see, it's as if the names were, Imam Busiri says it in the last chapter, it says, maybe because I'm named Muhammad that I'll be saved on the day of judgment. You see. And they have an overwhelming effect on, on, um, <clears throat> on the children. I said to my wife last time that I, I, I was adamant. My daughter let one of Iman. But I want to name a Fatima as well. If I had 10, I'll name them all Fatima. But it's difficult to differentiate them. You see. Uh, difficult to differentiate. Um... You know, I listened to Shay, uh, Ibrahim yesterday and he said uh, that uh, he, uh, I don't know if you heard it in this recent tour that they had. He said, uh, my wife gave birth to a girl. I went to Habib Umar and I said to Habib, you know, what should I name my daughter? He said, uh, take three names. We'll cast lots and we pick them out. He said, uh, what three names said Fatima, Khatija and Aisha. He said, I met Habib Umar in front of the, the, the road of the messenger of God, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, have you got the names? He said, I've got them. Look where he meets him. He said, I've got the names. He said, let's cast a lot. He said, no. He said, you give me the name. He said, no, no, we cast it. He said, no. He said, you give the name. I don't want it from casting lots. I want it to come from you. He said, if you want it to come from me, then he says, we don't prefer anybody over Fatima. That's it. That's like the, the be all and end all. And uh, so he, I assume he named the Fatima to Zahra. Yeah. <laughs> that's my assumption. So that's Fatima to Zahra. I want to talk about some other Sahaba now. About you, you want to talk about love, and I'm not. I'm talking about real, real love. Abdullah ibn Umar is the son of Sayyidina Umar. 
عبد الله بن عمر. Let's look at some aspects of his this hub that we're talking about. I have a sub sub. I have a sub and the hub are mukatimun. They say that he would be riding his camel or his horse, and he would randomly get off in different places. I've mentioned this before in the retreat, and he would just start walking, and then he would come back and get back on, and he would do it all of the time. Or he would go get up and make a sajda somewhere, and they said, you know, why are you why are you doing it? He said, by God, the messenger used to do it. He walked there one day, just walked there. And I thought I want to walk where he used to walk in his foot feet. He was not, he didn't plan it. He was overcome by the connection to the messenger of Allah. Look at the love that he had. What about walking here? What about sunnah? People talk about sunnah. He just wants to walk in the same footsteps. Maybe I can get the barakah, the barakah of the earth. And they say, what well, about earth? What barakah is there in earth? Let me tell in the earth. Ibn Hajr al Asqalani talks about why the Messenger of God went to Baytul Maqdis to go to the heavens. Why do you need to go to Baytul Maqdis for? God can take you to the heavens, correct? God could have taken him from Mecca. Could have taken him from Mecca. Why did he go to Baytul Maqdis? Ibn Hajr says, because Baytul Maqdis, the land, is the land that we will gather on the day of judgment. And just by the feet of the blessed Qadjameen, the blessed feet of the Messenger of Allah touching the land, it would give it mercy for the Day of Judgment. It's one of the reasons that Ibn Hajar mentions. You see, the Sharaf, the lands has Sharaf. You see, we wouldn't be able to say it otherwise. Say so this was the land of the great prophets of Bani Israel. It's the land of the Messenger of God as well. Now, He blessed the land. So you, just by him, just touching that land, and that shows you just in the earth, the kind of the power in the in the earth the messiah allah said a time will come when they will destroy my city literally meaning they will change the soil do you know they've changed all the soil of medina Munawwara? it's not madani soil anymore a lot of them they brought other soil into the city you see he used to cure people's diseases he used to cure their diseases so uh, uh, that's uh, abdullah ibn umar i want to mention some some other stories of love uh, uh, I want to talk about um, Abu Dharr al-Ghifari and his love for the Messenger of God. Abu Dharr al-Ghifari is from the Ghifara tribe. They were rough people, tough people. They were bandits as well from them. Abu Dharr was different. Abu Dharr was very strict, very strict. He was so strict that he used to stand in the marketplace admonishing people. One day he was sitting with the Messenger of God. He said, Ya Abu Dharr, he said, they will cast you out of the city. What will you do? They will cast you out. They will tell you to leave. He looked at the Messiah of Allah. He said, I'm going to fight them. I'm not leaving this place. He said, you're not going to fight them. He said, you're going to leave. You're going to leave. Which caliphate did was he, was, was he sent out? The caliphate said, no, Uthman. There are reasons why, you know, and not, not to talk about today. Just on the word of the message of Allah, he said, Love bacon, and he left. And he said, Don't worry, they'll find you. They'll find you. He was alone when he died. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud happened to be riding past. And the woman came out and she said, one of she said, somebody's died, and they went in and they said, We saw Abu Dhar Ghifari. The message of God promised him that they'll come back for him, the Sahaba and bury him. But just on the command of the Messenger of God, God he went. Sayyidina Bilal was a different story though. Sayyidina Bilal is like, um, he's the embodiment of, uh, he's, you know, I want, Busiri is almost like the Bilal of his time. And I, I don't say that with any reservation actually. He's like the Bilal of his time. Why? Because Sayyidina Bilal, he, he, was, he became ill. He was incredibly ill. He was in Medina and he became ill. He couldn't get up in the morning. He literally couldn't get up. And he became ill and he left. He left Medina al Munawwara. Which person leaves Medina al Munawwara? Who would leave it? But there must be a very good reason for you to leave it. You see. And he left and went to Syria or went to, uh, to another place. And uh, the message of Allah wasn't. There was a problem. 
there's a problem and see if, the, if there's a problem between you and the beloved you're going to know about it pretty quickly there's a problem between you and them see them this person is connected spiritually with the messenger of god connected Bilal he had a dream and the prophet said bilal why have you left us you have left us for what reason one day went to sleep he didn't get it he woke up he's even more ill now goes to sleep again the prophet said yeah bilal why have you left us again and then the third time the third time he said i have to return and he went back to medina al-munawwara which which the whole story which i'm not going to narrate or which i am going to narrate because it's probably the most if you want to know about real love it's not what bilal did it's what the people's reaction was see if of what love does to people what love do, love for the message of god does to people all of the sahaba were very very aware that the prophet sallallahu left this world when he left this world on that day he kept saying the umar wouldn't believe it he just wouldn't he couldn't he couldn't take the news so anybody who says that he's dead he said i'll kill him you know and they said that abu bakr calmed him down and then walked into the room and said that abu bakr looked at and this is just, I'm just going to give different stories of the love. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he, he, he beseeched the Messenger of Allah and then he kissed his head. In one narration, Sayyidina Umar, um, a Sahabi turned and they saw a man weeping in the corner. And they said to Sayyidina Umar, who's that man? Yeah, who's that man? Some say it's a story, some say it's a narration, Allah knows best. Just crying in the corner, another man. He said, he said, he said, Thaka Khadir Sahib Musa. So that's Khadir. The companion of Moses, who's come to the funeral or come to the uh, to see the messenger of Allah leave this world, Ali Salatu Wasalam. So Abu Bakr was overcome as well, and he kissed him on his right. He said, "Oh, my beloved companion," and then he he left. But that was a reaction. So Bilal said that Bilal comes back, and the story is famous. But I meant because it's very very. So some say that the Imam Hassan and Hussein convinced him to do the adhan. Now it's important if they're in the story. Because Sayyidina Bilal refused to do it. They said, do the Adhan. He said, no. He said, when I did Adhan and I turned my head, I saw the message of God. He said, who am I going to look at? But if you want to get into somebody's, if you want to get somebody to say yes, it's a very easy way to do it. You send the blood of the message of God to him. The blood relatives. Nobody refuses the blood relatives of the message of God. Nobody. The Albait. Some say that they sent Imam Hassan and Hussein. You see, they went and Imam Hassan and Hussein go to the to say that Bilal, and they say, "Look, we can't remember it. Wanna, we want to recall that. Can can you do it? He doesn't. He's La Baker. He doesn't want to do it. But you know, we have to look at who's asking. Who's asking? You know, what a good ride they have. But what an excellent rider." When the Prophet saw some had Imam Hassan on his back, you know, in the in in the famous famous narration, and um, now everybody knows. But the first point of this story, in my opinion, anyway, is the most troubling, the greatest, and the almost the greatest sign of love. Yeah. So people are about their business now. In this midday, by the way, this is not Aisha. We know this is midday. They're about their business. One person is farming. Medina was a small city. One person is about his business dealing in the marketplace. One person is teaching in the masjid of the message of God. Another is probably in this Kailula. Who knows when, when what they were doing? So Sayyidina Bilal began to read the Adhana. And he got to Ashadu. And he doesn't say Ashadu. Sinu Bilal Sheen. He can't say Sheen. And the Prophet said the Sheen of Bilal. The scene of Bilal is Sheen. He would say, Ashadu. Now, when they heard that, what would the reaction of certain people be? They would say, Oh, love is contained within just Ittiba'in, the following of the Sunnah. So they would have said, Oh, Bilal's doing Adhan, mashallah. Let's, let's listen to the Adhan. Ah. Say, so mashallah, remember that Adhan. What a wonderful Adhan. Let's listen to the Adhan. They didn't say that. You know, people now, you know, what wonderful, you know, let's go listen to. This Qari, the wonderful voice the Qari has. It's not the voice of the Qari. It's not the voice of the Qari. It's the heart of the Qari. And it's 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 the word of God. 
You don't need a voice for that necessarily. It's just the state of the person. You know, they didn't say, oh, remember, mashallah, let's have said that Bilal is here. Nobody said that. When they heard that scene, something triggered in their minds, like something in there, it's natural triggered. They literally, they say, mothers drop their children and they all flooded towards the sound. And the nida, the call was very clear. They said, I don't remember the exact word. They said the messenger of God has returned. It's kind of the most overwhelming. Everybody's weeping. Their mind is not saying Bilal's voice. They don't even know if Bilal's there. All they can feel is that when they saw Bilal, they saw the messenger of God, the connection. When Bilal did the adhan, he sees the messenger of God, Ali salatu wasalam. They hear the adhan, the messenger of God has returned. Now people will say that, that's love. That's the overwhelm, that's all that triggered. And they got there, and there's no messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. And Bilal collapses at that point. Some say he did not finish the adhan, say that Bilal collapsed at that point. They had to carry him away and he left, left the city. And he died sometime soon after that. This is real love of the companions, triggered by just one letter, a scene. A scene, one letter, reminds them of the Messenger of Allah. We have to have 10 hour durus. These people were triggered by a scene. Scene also is for Sayyid. You see, uh, one scene triggers the greatest moment where we talked about the types of love anguish pure bitter anguish they receive at the end of it that they can't see the face of the master allah the countenance of the master allah alayhi salatu wasalam. i want to talk about a few other people that were connected uh to their love was connected to the master allah alayhi salam. the shaykh this uh, this is another book that i have mentions about imam malik and other people as well i want to keep it with sahaba the famous narration of utbi this narration by the way is remarkable because it's in every single tafsir and I'm going to quote the verse and then I want to talk about it. About hub. You want to talk about hub, love for the Messenger of God, Ali Salatu Wasalam. Um, Allah in the Quran says, أنفسهم, And when they wrong themselves, well, it's not Quran. Uh, when they wrong themselves, أنفسهم, the word dhul means when they, when they put something. In a place that shouldn't have been there. Allah says, Ja'uka. If only they had come to you, or in the, the or they came to you. Fastagfarullah. And they repented to God, ask God for forgiveness. That's not enough though. Wastagfarullah Rasul. And then the Messenger of God asked on their behalf. Only then, Lam li ta'kid, la wajadun rahima. Only then would they have found the forgiveness of God. Only then. This man in the hadith of Utbi, some say it's weak. It's strong enough for every single Mufassir to have put it in his tafsir. Everybody quoted it, everybody mentioned it. A man comes, called the hadith Utbi, comes to the grave of the Messenger of God. Manzara, Qabri, Wajibat Lahu Shafa'ati. About five years ago, I saw something on, on the internet. And there was this person on the internet, Allah guiding, saying, Oh, they quote a hadith. Man wajibat, uh, manzara, Qabri, Wajibat Lahu Shafa'ati. Whoever sees my grave, my, my Shafa'a is guaranteed for him. He said, Where is there proof of this? Where is there proof of this? We're going to go anywhere, dude. Proofs on the Day of Judgment. <laughs> I mean, it's like, don't worry about it. It's, it'll, it'll come. It'll be empirical. You don't need theoretical proof. It'll be empirical. And there are plenty of evidences for it. So he turns up this Bedouin man. And he literally goes to the grave of the mercy of God. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, I have wronged myself. God said, if you've wronged yourself, Zalamu Anfus, I have wronged myself. Really amazing that Busiri uses the exact same word. You know this word, oppress myself. He uses the exact same word in chapter 3. I have wronged, 
I have wronged the way of he who I'm going to translate it my way. Okay, I'm going to translate it. I'm going to change that now. Valama also means to be dark. I have brought darkness to the path when he gave light to the night. That's what it means. To such or such that his ankles would moan, become swollen and moan of pain. Meaning they would be durra min warami. About the night of the Prophet Same words he's using. And he says, he so he says, O Messenger of God, alayhi salam. So he says, I have wronged myself. That's me. Abdullah here has wronged himself. He said, God told me to come to you, Jauka. He said, I'm not asking you. This is a guarantee. God said it. God said, I just have to come. I don't even have to say anything. God said, Jauka. That's all God said. And God then said, and then you make the forgiveness for me. He said, God said it. God has said it. So that's what I've come for. That he was guaranteed. He was like, that was it for him. You know. And uh, uh, he he walked away. In several narrations, one Sayyidina Ali is asleep at the grave. Again, at the grave. Of sleep. And in his sleep, the messenger of God comes and he says, go and get that man. Tell him God has forgiven him for his sins. In another narration that some mention, they heard the voice from the grave of the messenger of God itself. Saying, oh man, God has forgiven you. From the grave of the messenger of God. <coughs> These people had a very good understanding. A very, very good understanding. You know, I'll narrate a story to you. I was at... Uh, a house of a sheikh in Morocco. Okay. I want to narrate this story. The great man of God. I believe anyway. In, in my heart anyway. The great man of God. And he won't know I'm telling this story because he doesn't know really what the internet is. <laughs> His name is Mawla Hashim al-Bilgithi al-Hassani. The great sheikh of the Darqa wa Tariqa. The Darqa wa Tariqa. I went to his house sitting with him. Old man. That means 80s. Or 70s or 80s. So we were talking and he was very quiet. He just has his desk in his hand. Very, very quiet. He looks at me and he says to me, he says, uh, he said, uh, he said, Hal ra'ita Nabi I didn't reply to him. I look at He said, have you ever seen the messenger of God in true light, in reality? And when they say that, they mean wakefully. He said, I still remember the words he used. He said, Hakikatan. And he doesn't talk much. Some of the brothers here that have met him will tell you he doesn't talk much. I got him talking that night though. I wrote in my journal all my conversations we had. And he says to me, I just stayed quiet. And he went quiet as well. And then he said to me, Sit down on Hajj some years ago. Hajj some years ago. And he said, I was on Hajj and um, I booked my ticket to come back home. I booked my ticket. And then I was ready, I packed my stuff. So I went to his sleep. He said, lo and behold, I'm standing in front of, not here. No, actually, what he said to me was also, he said, then he said, hal ra'ita rawdata nabi sallam kama kanat fi asrihi. Have you seen the rawda of the Masha Allah as it was in his time, just after me? The asr al-sahab. I, I, I just like, it wasn't even, I didn't even say anything. Then he went quietly later, he told me. So, so he said, in the night time, he said, I was standing, he said, in my dream. He didn't even say dream to me. I don't know what he words he used. It. He said, there, lo and behold, I'm in front of the grave of the messenger of God. He said, not this grave. No. He said, the grave, the roda. He said, that's what the sahaba used to see. He said, I was, and I'm looking at it. He said, lo and behold, rising from the grave is the messenger of God. Rising from the grave is the messenger of God. And that's his grandfather. So I looked at him. The messenger of God, he said, I gazed upon the face of the messenger of God. And the messenger of God said to me, he said, Aina tadhhab ya Hashim. He said, Hashim, where are you going? He said, so I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Sayyidi, he said, 
He said, what's on you? He said, I'm going home. And he said, the message of God said, be idni man. He said, by whose permission are you leaving? He said, I stood there. He said, by whose permission are you leaving? I swear to you, this is the story that he told me. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ma indi visa. He said, Ya Rasulullah, he said, I've got no visa. He said, the Masjid of God looked behind him and he said, the Indians and the Pakistan, the Bengalis were all cleaning the Masjid. So we had some maqam. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, and who gives them their visa? Who gives them their visa? And he said, I looked up. He said, I give them their visa. He said, I give people stay in the city. He said, nobody has authority over the authority. I he said, you're not going anywhere till I tell you. He said, I woke up. He said, by God, he said, I unpacked my stuff. He said, I don't know what to do. He said, I stayed there for over six months until the message of God gave me permission. He said, I walked through the airport. And nobody asked me any questions. And I came home. That's a man's heart who's with the heart of the messenger of God, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's a serious. Then he said to me, I'll tell you another story. His son was there. His son walked out the room. His son is a scholar, Shia Abdul Kabir. He said, Hada Abdul Kabir. They have the French type of accent of Iraq. He said, Hua kana fi sigrihi yara nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Da'im, da'im, da'im. He said, he, my son, when he was a boy, he would always see the messenger of God in his dream. He said, to test him, I would ask him questions. I used to say, if you've seen the messenger of God, then ta- go and ask the messenger of God. On this day, at this time, what did he say to me? On this day, on this time, what did he say to me? And then I believe you. And he said, you should come back and tell me. This is a man of God. Real man of uh, you should go meet him, inshallah. He's in Marrakesh. He doesn't come out very much though. But he's a man of God. Very simple man. You meet him. He's just a simple man. He just put food out for you to eat. That's all he does. He just walks out the room, comes back, puts food down. He very rarely talks. But this is a man whose heart is connected to the messenger of God. He told me that his father, another one of the little stories, said, My father, he told me his father was a great man of God as well. Said my father, I'm talking about people's love for the message, what he gives them. He said, My father said he was dreaming, he was in a dream, and he's holding hands with the companions. And in the middle of all of them is the messenger of God. Okay. And he said, All of us in the dream, they said, He said, We, he said, In the dream, my father said, All of us disappeared into the, ascended into the sky into light. He said, My father said to me that when he woke up, he was standing like this. Standing like that. These are people who are connected to the Masjid of Allah. I'm not talking Ghazali 7th century. I'm talking this century. These people, lovers of the Messenger of God and the kind of effects. This is real. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I saw a video of uh, my, uh, my Shaykh, our Shaykh, Shaykh Ahmed Habbad, before he left this world. And Sheikh Said Burhani, who's also passed away now, is in, in, the, uh, in, in the room with him. And Sheikh Ahmed Habbal, I'm very uh, 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 lucky that I never got to see him in that state, in his bed. I only got to see him on his seat. You see, it'd be very difficult for me. So uh, they're sitting there. And he's, he's, he was close to before he died. Sheikh Said says to him that, Sheikh, Sheikh Said said, it's Sheikh Ahmed Habbal is telling them to make dua for him. So he make the offer. And Sheikh Said, watch the videos online, but there's no translation. There. He said, he said, say that you do it. He said, you are the one who is always with the messenger of God. That, that was a man's level. Some people would say in Damascus that he would be seen with the messenger of God. Sheikh Ahmed Habbal. He was a man. He was a grandson of the Prophet as well. But he was a man that was always connected uh, to the messenger of God. Not just through pra- like practice. It's, he's just over... Um, it's just is overwhelmed by the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu, overwhelmed by the person of the messenger of Allah, like Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyah in Kitab al-Ruh, his soul encompasses the cosmos by the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam. Some other sahaba that I might mention before we... Uh, I mentioned earlier the Abu Yubal Ansari and the grave, that he was leaning his face against the grave um, of the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa sallam. Um, now I, I'm going to conclude here then, inshallah. I had some more preparation, but we we'll get into the end. I don't like going over the time. Um, now, uh, I just want to finish off with this point. 
you know Ahlul Sunnah, uh, you know, we're always <coughs> criticized some, or sometimes criticized that people say, oh, these same people, they don't practice properly. And yeah, I'm against them. Uh, anybody who doesn't practice or follow the Sunnah is wrong. Is wrong. Is completely wrong. But that doesn't mean the person doesn't have love in them. Bear that in mind. Love is a completely, can be a different. Nu'iman is clear about that. When he drank alcohol, but he loved the messenger of God. Don't curse him. فَإِنَّهُ يُحِبُّ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ He loves God and his messenger. He loves God and his messenger. You see. And here I want to say the, the, the following. And I'm going to finish off with this. Is that I personally think that we have lost uh, a kind of connection to the Messiah Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. You see, we have, we have definitely lost the connection. Because if we had him, then why don't we see him? Question is very simple. If we haven't lost the connection, then where, where is the message of God to us? The people who love the message of God see the message of God. Or he sees them. Or comes to visit them. And I would say that our lifelong ambition, lifelong ambition is to see the message of God in our dreams. And in a wakeful state, if that being possible. But he would definitely be there if we see him in our dreams. And uh, he, alayhi salatu wasalam, I mentioned the earlier, uh, the earlier segments. Uh, and I think that that's that absolute love. And on the day of judgment, he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, al mar'u ma'aman ahab. That the one who, uh, it, it, the one, one is with the one who he loves, with the one he loves. Anas ibn Malik was dancing on that day. Dancing. He said, yeah, so easy. Uh, no doubt. Yeah, he... It's done, it's done, uh, but not done for us. And I personally think that we not need to have gatherings like this, we need to have hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. We need to have gatherings. What I tell you, what people lack in this day and age why is depression so widespread? Because nobody, people don't feel love from anybody. Let me tell you something uh, the messenger loves all of us. You see, all of us, he loves all of us. So much so that he would stay up all of those nights and say, Allah wa in to adibu fa innam ibadu Allah. If you punish them, they are your people, but if you forgive them, you are the greatest, the most wise. It pains the messenger of God. Nothing pains him more to see his one, his 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 followers upset. Pains the messenger of God to see them upset. Two, when they break ties. He loves nothing more than when they love him. Reciprocation on the day of judgment, everybody will find out on the sirat. sirat you know, I just want to probably mention the sirat a little bit. Say that Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, will a beloved remember the one that he loves and they remember each other on the day of judgment? He said, Ya Aisha, yes, they will. Not in three places, though. And he mentioned the three places. And then later in the commentary to that hadith is the discussion about the sirat. That the messenger of God stands at the Sirat. Look at the, just look at the whole scene. He doesn't cross it yet. And he waits for his people to come. He will advance first over, over the Burak, but saying what? He waits for his people saying, Allahumma sallim, sallim, or Ya Rab sallim, sallim. God, make it easy for them to cross it. At every juncture, the Prophet says, Allahumma, or Ya Rab sallim, sallim. And he said, no prophet can speak on that day before I speak. Nobody can speak until I speak. And that's something very, very important. That, uh, that imagine on the day of judgment. Imagine on the day of judgment that we are in that gathering. I, I, I said in London, people talk about the Mawlid here. Imagine the Mawlid in Al-Jannah. People have a, the hair of the messenger of God. Often they don't have adab to be honest with you. But anyway. They have the hair. Look at the state of people just to see the hair of the messenger of God. Just to see. What if the messenger of God was sitting there? Imagine those maulids. Because they're going to be maulids. They're going to be parties. Very big heavenly parties. Very big heavenly maulids. But the difference is not with Zayd or Bakr. With Abu Bakr. And Zayd ibn Thabit. And Hassan ibn Thabit. And Umar ibn Khattab. And Anas ibn Malik. You see those, and for see, and Fatima to Zahra Ali. Imagine that. Isn't it worth it for that? For us, is it not worth 
the presence. Imagine that maulid. And that's why they say the heavens. When people say, what are we going to do in heaven? Are we going to get bored? No, no we're just going to have maulids. I mean, who's going to get bored of that? You see, people in Rabi don't want it to finish. It's like, oh, tomorrow I'm going here. And they go for the food. They go for the singing. And they go for the company. But you're going to get the best food. You're going to get the best singing. And boy, are you going to get the best company. In the company, in the company the, the, uh, with Rafiq al-A'la, the company of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wa salam. Yeah? The, 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 the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, that's my uh, advice to myself. Those are the two lines of Abu Siri. And we finished with two lines today. Next time is much different. Layla Majnoon is going to come back. Imra ul Kais is coming next time. Kafa and Nabki Mizikr Habibi wal Manzili. Next month. This is going to take a very long time. Akula Koli Hada. Please, can you put. You know what? We need your emails. Not because we want your money or anything. We need your emails because uh, then we can update you on all the things. If you just. Even if you put it down already, put it down again. We just need to build a database. So we can inform you if where something's going on, if there's cancellation, a delay, all of our, we want to make one really big, stop the recording, I want to say something. Uh,